This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone. I'm Tanya. And I'm Talia. And we are Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. Hi, Tanya. What's new today? Oh, nothing. <laughs> me either. I, I hate it when you throw me <laughs> off script like that. There's nothing new. Well, I have kind of an unusual story for you today. We're going to start today's episode a little different. I want you and our listeners to pretend that you're in an online group for people who consider themselves problem drinkers, maybe not necessarily alcoholics but just problem drinkers, which I don't know exactly what the difference is, but just go with me okay. on this one. The group offers advice. It's like a way for people just to talk to other people with their same problems. And in the group is about 200 people. Are we anonymous? Some people are anonymous, but you can also post under your real name. It's up to you how anonymous you want to be. And one day you read in the messages in the group, and there's one that catches your eye. It's from a man named Larry, and Larry has been an active member of the group for the past several months. And Larry has not posted anonymously. He's used his real name. So the message that catches your eye, I'm going to read it for you. It says, quote, Hi, I need to get something off my chest. Three years ago, I felt terrible rage toward my ex-wife for what she put me through in our long custody battle. While I was the victor, my rage would not subside. Alcohol was my one and only friend. Sure, my five-year-old daughter lived with me, but I knew my ex-wife would continue to seek custody. The solution was to kill my daughter. One evening, three years ago, I let my daughter watch her favorite videos and then I put her to bed. I then locked all the doors and set my house on fire. I went to my bedroom and waited for the fire to spread. When I heard my daughter scream, I climbed out a window. When her scream stopped, I presumed she was dead. I pretended to save her by climbing back into the house. As I picked her body up, there was still a wheezing breath. I dropped her body to the floor, escaped again through the window, and acted frantic and shocked until the police arrived. Her death was ruled accidental. So Talia, if you read this message in this group, what would you do? That's the whole message? That's the whole message. Whoa. And I'll give you some options. And if our listeners could also decide what they'd want to do, here are some options of things that you could possibly do. You could ignore the message. You could reason in your head that the child was already dead and there's nothing that could be done to save her, so you're not going to do anything. What? You what? could... <laughs> How is any of the... Okay, sorry. You can engage in flame wars. And do you know what a flame war is? No. It's basically like when you're on the internet with someone and you're just arguing back and forth and name calling and doing all of these things. So you can engage in a flame war with other list members and defend Larry's behavior. No. You could assume that no one in his right mind would confess openly to this tragedy and assume that it's a hoax. You could assume that the memory of the fire must have been so painful that Larry's damaged mind was producing a false memory. You could... Find the name of a reputable counselor and send this recommendation in a message back to Larry. You could counsel Larry by saying things such as, Larry, please don't blame yourself. I don't feel like that's a viable option for me either. You could show good leadership in the member group and explain to the members that Larry was mentally ill and that the child probably never existed. Do I know that Larry's mentally ill? No. You could... Consider informing the police, but wait to see if anyone else on the list does it first. Or you could decide to notify the police immediately after receiving this message. Well, I would like to think I would do the last one, the latter option. There's something many people don't know about me. I have reported on two different people to the police and had to testify as witnesses at two different trials. So I am kind of... You've done it before. I've done it before. I'd like to believe 
as I'm sure everybody out there would like to believe, that we would call the police. But I have a feeling you're going to tell me that most likely I wouldn't. (laughs) Well, now that everyone's heard the scenario, and you've kind of in your head chosen what you'd do, this confession was a real confession that was made in a group in March of 1998, and out of the 200 people in that group, only three of them actually called the police. Did all 200 see the message? Well, the board, I'll explain a little later how this group is set up. I'm assuming that all 200 of them saw it. All 200 of them definitely had means to be able to see it. So three called the police. Three called the police. And as I get further into the story, I'm going to tell you other things that people did. Oh, I can't wait. Well, one of the people that called the police was a woman named Lisa. She was a member of this group. It was called Moderation Management. She attended this group because while she didn't think she was an alcoholic, she thought she had a problem with drinking. She didn't like going to Alcoholics Anonymous necessarily because she felt they were just a little too self-righteous because in this moderation management group, they did condone like light drinking as opposed to AA, you cannot drink at all alcohol. She enjoyed moderation management as a group because members were usually very supportive and helpful to one another, even when someone drank alcohol. Lisa checked the group obsessively. It was sort of an addiction for her. Maybe it becomes a community that you feel that you're part of and involved in. Right. And I think she really felt that genuinely. The way that the group was set up, it wasn't like what you would picture like a Facebook group today. It was actually like a mailing list. And any of the messages that members send to the list was then automatically forwarded to all the members in an email. And then if a member responded to it, that also went out to all the members. Sounds like your inbox would be flooded. Right. It was kind of like receiving a group email. And I've been on lists like that before where you kind of get a synopsis of everything that got sent out that day, like in list form, and then you can click on it and read it. So I'm thinking that's more of what it was like. That member, Lisa, that I mentioned, she would go through the new emails she received every morning with her morning coffee. So this was a routine for her. She was very active in the group, usually sending messages daily that talked about her alcohol addiction and insights into her life because she was, she considered herself successful as far as tackling her alcohol problem. She enjoyed participating in the group because it did give her a bit of anonymity where she could talk about her life because like her friends did not know she had this battle with alcohol. She was married and her husband knew, but not her outside friends. Lisa said that the group wasn't perfect. However, some members would post things that were basically like incoherent babblings. Like if someone fell off the wagon and got real drunk and then they'd post something. I could see that. Yeah, me too. She was also worried a little bit about the confidentiality She said that the introductory email that the group sends out when you join, it only recommends to not post under your real name. Like there's no lock and key to this group. Pretty much anybody could join by just clicking a button. They also didn't say like they're there to keep your secrets. In their initial email, it's not like they're like, oh, anything you post on here is confidential. They did not have that as a role. Even if they did. Yeah, (laughs) right. Someone tells me that they've murdered their child, I'm breaking the confidentiality rule. Right. There also was an in-person meeting that was associated with this group that only took place in New York. And Lisa lived in New York, so she would attend these meetings in person, and I believe they were probably about once a month. So sometime during the weekend of March 21st... What year is it? 1998. Larry posted that his girlfriend had left him and he had been drinking too much. So this preceded the email that he sent out. The group, as expected, reassured Larry that he would heal from that wound with time, but Larry fired back that the group didn't know the real him, that he was a worthless person because he had murdered his daughter. And he initially didn't offer any further explanation. Lisa saw this message and wrote back on the next day, March 22nd, quote, what do you mean? You murdered your daughter? Is that emotional hyperbole or cold fact? End quote. She thought, maybe is he talking in metaphors? Also that day, she was on her way to a birthday party with her husband, so she wasn't able to check if she received a message for hours. When she got home, she checked. 
She wasn't expecting an answer from Larry, and she was really surprised when she got one. This is when she discovered that Larry had sent the entire group his detailed confession that I read to you when we first started this episode. One thing I didn't include when I first initially read you the message was that Larry got drunk when he set this house fire. And I think he passed out because he said after he made this confession that his daughter's screams are what woke him up and allowed him to escape. And he said, quote, those last two screams that I tell everyone saved my life, they are wounds on my soul that I can't heal and that I'm sure I meant to carry with me, end quote. He wrote that in the group, too. Yes, he wrote that in the group. He's just sharing his all his demons. Right? So as you can imagine, the responses to his quote-unquote confession, email, whatever you want to call it, just exploded in this message group. There were tons of responses on the list as well as Lisa was receiving private emails sent to her. Because she was so active on the list, people sort of looked at her as a leader and often wanted her advice. So they weren't from Larry, they were from other people? They were other people in the group. One said, what can we do? One email said, help me here in all caps. One woman who barely knew Larry forwarded a personal email he had written at the same time he confessed. He wrote to this woman, quote, honey, I can make a difference for you if you give me a chance. I would love to try being close to you, end quote. Oh, hell no. I know. And supposedly he just broke up with his girlfriend. And confessed to killing his daughter. Right? Yeah. Weird. And now he's looking for love. (laughs) I know. It's so bizarre, right? As Lisa was reviewing these emails, she also had instant messenger and those things started to pop up all over her screen. One list member, a woman named Lucy, not her real name, sent Lisa her telephone number because now everybody's on high alert, and the paranoia factor is prevalent. Lisa called Lucy right away, and shortly into their conversation, they agreed that they had to call the police. However, as I mentioned earlier, the majority of members on the list didn't go to the police. Many said they had the genuine belief that Larry was having survivor's guilt over surviving the house fire that killed his daughter, and the confession was just one way for Larry to experience some sort of punishment for surviving. He seemed kind of detailed, though. Right? (laughs) I know. I mean... Right. The day after he sent this email, on the evening of March 22nd, one person wrote in response to Larry's confession, quote, Oh man, you're really challenging me. It would be okay if you would just go away. This is just repulsive stuff and I can't deal with you. I personally will not read a post by you again. You do not deserve anything. Really? That's their response? That's their response. Someone else responded to that, saying, quote, to me, your post is completely unacceptable, especially in this forum. I'm repulsed by your post, end quote. This is just ridiculous. I know. What is this madness? I know, they're just arguing with each other back and forth. Some members in the group simply wanted to get back to the purpose of the group, and somebody wrote, quote, can we please talk about drinking? I need your help here, end quote. I think I would start drinking. <laughs> Right? right? I would definitely need some help with a glass of wine at this point. I mean, I would like to think, too, that I would call the police. I think this would cause extreme turmoil for me, personally. Larry never mentioned where the house fire took place, but Lisa remembered that he mentioned how he now lives in San Diego. And in the confession, he mentioned that he was flown to Rapid City, South Dakota, for observation shortly after the fire. As I mentioned... Lisa was beside herself and had decided to call the police. So the day following Larry's confession, she faxed copies of the confession to the Rapid City, South Dakota, and San Diego, California police departments. A little over a week later, she received a phone call from the Rapid City detective, who told her that three years earlier, in 1995, Larry's five-year-old daughter had died in a house fire in Bowman, North Dakota. And Bowman was a really small town. The population is only about 1,700 people. Lisa had hoped when she contacted the police that Larry's confession was just a hoax. It may be just some sort of twisted metaphor, like I mentioned earlier. But like maybe he is just an insane and it's just shit. Yeah, maybe he's just crying for help or something. However, she now knew the truth. Her facts to the police had prompted a homicide investigation in North Dakota. The North Dakota police called Lisa on a daily basis, asking for copies of every posting that Larry had made in the group after he made the confession. 
they told her that the local police in Bowman had all known Larry and his family very well and that it was actually the chief of police who responded to the house fire. Because of the personal relationship that Larry had with members of the police, that was one reason they'd ruled the fire accidental, despite the fact that some aspects of it didn't necessarily add up. Did he have a personal relationship just because it was such a small town? Yes. No one really believed he was capable of doing such a thing, and they looked at him more like, oh, not poor Larry, after the horrible divorce that he went through. They just didn't think he was that type of person. And as a note, he worked for Sony. He was like a software engineer. I think maybe he made video games or something like that. So they just thought he was just a nice, mild man or man. So he was an educated man with a good career. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Did he have a history of violence towards no. his daughter? No. And he fought really hard to get custody for her. So that's why this is just very strange. But I'm sure you're going to tell me more. Oh, absolutely. We're just peeling back the layers like an onion. We're going to take a break. The officer that was in touch with Lisa reassured her that she did do the right thing by going to the police because they told her, you know, you never know. He could go out and do this thing again someday. So not only did they ask for the postings that Larry did, they also asked her to continue going on the list like she used to do and just not breathe a word about how the police were now involved. During one of the conversations that Lisa had with the officer, he mentioned to her that out of the 200 people who were on the list, only two had gone to the police and one was including her. She did find out later that one other person did go to the authorities, but the investigator told her they all wondered in the police department, what type of group was this exactly? Where someone confesses to murder and barely 2%, it's like I did the math. It's like one and a half percent of the population of this group went to the police. Just like in our other stories where people don't want to get involved. Right. Passing people who are screaming and needing help. And remember Murphy's Creek? There yes. Are two girls tied on the side of the road and six cars passed by and didn't do anything. That's the one that popped into my head. I just couldn't remember the title. But yeah, it's unbelievable. Now, this was real easy to go to the police. They could have done so anonymously. So just to tell you what kind of group they were, I'm going to tell you a little bit more. So the morning after his confession, Larry started writing emails to the group suggesting that he had, had imagined the whole thing. Oh, so he's backtracking. Yes, he's backtracking. He said, quote, this situation is very confusing to me. Is there a chance I'm not the horrible person I feel like? You know, as you mentioned, he's dialing it back. He's kind of scared. He mentioned that his mom was schizophrenic. And later he said that he had been on medication that could have caused him to make this false confession. Many on the list were sympathetic to Larry, attacking anyone who had the honesty to say they were disturbed or concerned over the message he had sent. One email said, frankly, I'm offended. This is a support group. <laughs> and support was in all caps. Are you kidding me? Lisa was shocked, just like you are now, over how people in the group reacted. Some were people she trusted, and she couldn't believe that there were so many people providing support to someone who had said he killed his five-year-old daughter. One group member defended him as, quote, one hurting puppy. Another counseled Larry, quote, please don't blame yourself, end quote. And Frederick Rogers, a professional psychologist who helped found the list and who acted as the list keeper, whom I'll call Fred, he maintained that not only was Larry mentally ill, but the child probably never even existed. Fred was also the director of the Program for Addictions, Consultation, and Treatment at Rutgers University. Really? Mm -hmm. When the police were busy working on getting an arrest warrant for Larry, Lisa called on the founder of Moderation Management. Her name was Audrey Kishline. Lisa told her what was going on. Lisa was just trying to get some support from someone and authority in the group for going to the police. She really expected Audrey to understand and even support what she did, but instead, Audrey was shocked to learn that the police were involved. She admitted that she hadn't wanted to go to authorities in part because of possible bad press. Really? Right. Audrey felt that the controlled drinking support group was controversial enough. And besides, she said to Lisa... Quote, what's done is done. I mean, the child has been dead for a while, hasn't she? End quote. I'm just dumbfounded. I know. And there's such selfishness involved Isn't with this. there? Somebody contacted Audrey later for an article that I had read. 
And she insisted that she was not sure the crime had actually happened or even whether they had a responsibility in the group to do anything about it. And just to give you context, Audrey and Moderation Management were on TV frequently in the 90s. They were featured on the Lisa talk show. Oh, yeah. Remember? And also they were written about in the New York Times, Newsweek, Time, Business Week, U.S. News and World Reports, as well as they had been on the Late Late Show with Tom Snyder, Good Morning America. You know, I get it. They were just all over the place. So that's the bad press and bad image that Audrey was trying to protect. And she mentioned that there were critics. Critics would say that the group was dangerous for people who were alcoholics because they allowed people to still drink alcohol. And they'd asked Audrey during some of these interviews, like, how can you tell the difference between an alcoholic and someone that's a problem drinker? Because there really is no test. So, I mean, there's really a gray line when it comes to that. That's the side that she was fighting against. So in the days following Larry's confession, Lisa just felt like all she could do was obsessively check the list all day. One afternoon during a call with the detective on the case, her call waiting beeped. Remember call waiting? Yeah. (laughs) It was Lucy who was completely hysterical. She told Lisa that Fred outed her to the list. And Lucy was one of the people when I first was telling you that her and Lisa had decided to go to the police. She said that Fred told the list that she went to the police. This caused Lisa to then start going to the list and checking the messages. Lucy had accidentally sent an email that was meant for Lisa to Fred. In the email, Lucy had mentioned Fred's quote unquote sucky attitude, (laughs) which (laughs) I want to tell you a little bit more about. So enraged, Fred responded on the list to all 200 subscribers making it clear it was Lucy he was replying to. He again pointed out that the child probably didn't exist. Probably. Probably. Maybe, but probably not. I mean, Probably not. I know. And he said that in his 25 years of experience as a therapist, that taught him how to read people pretty well and that Larry was no criminal. He announced that the police had been notified. This also meant that Larry now knew the authorities were after him. The email Fred sent was on March 26th, and it said, quote, My position here, you're going to love this. My position here is that we, as a list, have two responsibilities here. To ourselves, as members of this list community, and to the larger community beyond. It may sound radical to some, but I believe it's an essential feature of the internet, and one that we must protect if it is to continue to be a source of great support for people who are in need. So what's he trying to say? Like, they have a duty to protect the people in the list, I'm thinking. Okay. Fred said that he didn't go to the police after being informed that someone else in the group already had because, quote, since the child was already dead, no purpose would have been served in the form of protecting anyone for rash, emotional, and poorly thought out action, end quote. He said instead of running to the police to report Larry, Fred said he sent a private email to Larry with referrals to therapists near San Diego. Well, isn't that helpful? I know. Here's a list of people to talk to about you murdering your daughter. Right. The next day after Lucy was outed to the list, Friday, March 27th, Larry was arrested in San Diego where he was held without bail. The police told Lisa that after his arrest, Larry had said he felt responsible for his daughter's death and that he had memories of setting the fire. Lisa asked Audrey, the founder of Moderation Management, if she would put a statement out on the list of what had happened, which she figured would settle everyone down. But Lisa couldn't have been more wrong. Audrey's statement read, in part, that the group had initially, quote, decided not to take any outside action, the event had already occurred, and there was no discussion about planning to commit a crime. She added with seemingly disapproval that, quote, several members independently took this matter to the authorities, end quote. I guess to deny culpability. And to show disagreement with the choice they made. Right. That night, the list exploded in a flame war, as I kind of mentioned earlier. The, (laughs) I'm just going to tell you some of the things it said. Someone wrote, quote, have fun with this, you cads and henpeckers. This came from some woman. I don't even know what a cad is. (laughs) Like, um, troublemaker? Okay. You have afforded him the opportunity to occupy that rack he has so long sought. What the fuck does that mean? Like, self-punishment? Okay. I have a question. Is it really that hard to start a new group? I know. 
I don't understand why these people are so hot and bothered over this. They're worried about the reputation. I mean, can you just start a new one after he's arrested and I know it's only 200 down? people. It's not like 20,000 people. There was one person, his name was Jim. He had went to the FBI with this confession. When news of Larry's arrest reached the group, one member called for the informers to come forward. So Jim, who said he'd been sober for 19 years, and he was a licensed chemical dependency counselor, he sent that member who asked for it a private email saying, you know, I want to remain anonymous, but I did go to the FBI. That person then posted the email to the whole list and sent Jim a private email back that said, quote, just how big a pervert are you? I bet you really get off talking to the FBI. Wow. Did you ask them if you could see their guns? What the hell is this? I feel like I'm in bizarro world. Others accused Jim, who was a proponent of Alcoholics Anonymous, of using this incident to tarnish the reputation of moderation management. Almost every single member there needs to be bitch slapped. This is insanity. Except for the three people, who was probably Jim, Lisa, and Lucy. For most in the group, the real issue was whether it was ethical for someone on the list to turn in one of their own. Absolutely it is. Right. And that was more of the topic than the murder of a five-year-old girl. Someone said, what bothers me is the apparent judgmental and unforgiving attitude. Lisa, again, I don't think her obsession with checking the list ever stopped. She was even losing sleep because she would go well into the night because these flame wars were just exploding and people back and forth. A man that she knew from the live meetings wrote a note that was just laced with profanity. And he lashed out at the, quote, meddlesome, tight ass, rat fink, minimus of an oozing worm turd, end quote. Wow. Who who had turned in his good friend, Larry. (laughs) His good friend, Larry. Mm Mm-hmm. He said, quote, this cyber canary will be discovered and will get whatever measure of curse or blessing that karma has to give, end quote. This moderation group is very scary. Honestly, these people are not. Super scary. Yes, right? Super nuts. Super nuts. After Larry was arrested, he was extradited to North Dakota for the murder of his daughter, Amanda. Lisa arranged to stop receiving mail from the list, and she eventually left the moderation management group, both online and in person which really kind of bummed her out because she felt she had benefited from the relationships she formed there. Larry is back in North Dakota in Bowman, which I had mentioned is a very small town. The courthouse where he was arraigned was only a few blocks away from the concrete slab that is all that's left of the house he burned down. His defense attorney said that Larry was going to plead not guilty to the murder charges, and his attorney was going to try and prove the confession was induced by alcohol and prescription antidepressants he was taking at the time, that this altered his mood. There was talk that Larry could maybe get the confession he made to the list suppressed on the grounds of therapeutic confidentiality. Nope. Yeah, but that never happened. Larry was eventually convicted of the murder of his five-year-old daughter. And I'll tell you what his sentence is in a little bit. You may be wondering, though, why Larry murdered his child when he had won custody of her after such a hard-fought battle. Well, in July 1994, Amanda's mother, Anne Purdy, and Larry had shared custody of her. Anne lived in South Dakota, and Larry lived in North Dakota. Amanda would live with Larry during the school year and with Anne during the summer. That summer, July 1994, while Amanda was living with Anne, Amanda's daycare provider told Anne that she should seek professional counseling for Amanda because of Amanda's aggressive behavior. So she's obviously acting something out. Anne took Amanda to a psychologist. During the course of her initial interview with the psychologist, Amanda told her that her dad, Larry, had been touching her genital area with his hand and with, quote, his a stick, end quote. Oh, Larry's a pervert. Larry's a pervert. As a result of these disclosures... The psychologist referred Anne to the South Dakota Department of Social Services, and the case was assigned to Lisa Fleming in the South Dakota Department of Social Services. After interviewing Amanda, and I'm going to refer to Lisa Fleming at the Department of Social Services as Fleming. So she initially interviews Amanda, and she relays to Anne the information she found out. 
Anne said that Fleming told her that Amanda didn't repeat her allegations of sexual abuse and that she just sounded like an angry child. However, Anne claimed that Fleming told her that when she interviewed Amanda, Amanda didn't tell her about the sexual abuse. But Fleming says that she did tell Anne of the sexual abuse during that initial interview. And the reason why I'm telling you this is because Anne ends up suing the Department of Social Services for a wrongful death suit. So they start their investigation at the Department of Social Services in South Dakota, but they believed they lacked jurisdiction because the abuse happened at Larry's house in North Dakota when Larry had physical custody of Amanda. Therefore, they referred the case to North Dakota's social services. It kind of just gets lost in the shuffle of bureaucracy. Because of Amanda's allegations against Larry, Anne tried to have the custody arrangement modified in North Dakota. Larry hired a man named Dr. Frank Bazetta, who was a licensed psychologist, to present a custody report. The North Dakota court ordered that the entire family go see Dr. Bazetta prior to them making a decision about Anne's motion to change custody. His final recommendation to the North Dakota custody court said that he believed that the sexual abuse allegations against Larry were false. So ultimately, Anne's motion to change the custody of Amanda was denied and custody remained the same with Amanda spending the school year with Larry and her summers with her mom, Anne. So he's got what he wanted, and they don't believe these allegations of sexual abuse. So what is the problem? The problem is that he ends up believing that Anne is going to continue to fight for Amanda because she believes that Amanda is being sexually abused. So in order to stop Anne and divulging more into Larry's life, he decides to kill Amanda. The little girl he fought so hard to have and raised nine months out of the year. Right. I know, that doesn't make any sense to me. But that's because he really did do it. And so the allegations are going to continue because he's a pedophile. He's not going to stop abusing his daughter. And when she goes visits her mom in the summer, she's going to say, you know, dad is still hurting me. And so this is going to be a never-ending accusation for him. The case that Ian filed against Lisa Fleming, her supervisor, and Dr. Bazetta ended up being thrown out. They said that the claim against Dr. Bazetta was barred because the statute of limitations had passed, and also there was governmental immunity, the qualified immunity for Lisa and her supervisor. The court, though, did have sympathy for Anne's position. The court said in their decision that Quote, it takes a strong judicial stomach to set aside one's emotions concerning the unspeakable acts inflicted upon Amanda and impartially review them as against the applicable law. The ultimate villain is in a North Dakota prison where he clearly belongs for a long time. Viewing the conduct of the defendants, especially with the benefit of hindsight, it hardly constitute a textbook perfect case about how to investigate and deal with allegations of sexual abuse upon children. The fate of Amanda will hopefully serve as a wake-up call that increased vigilance is needed to avoid a tragic repeat of this type of case. End quote. So I didn't tell you what happened to Larry, but when he was arrested and extradited to North Dakota, there was also federal charges filed against him because when they had searched his house and they searched his computer, they found child porn. Of course. On his computer. Of course. And that is a federal offense. Because he's a perv. Right. And they also found that he confesses to the murder in this moderation management group. who is also part of an online group of pedophiles. And he confessed to molesting Amanda in that group. What? I don't know if he did it on the same day. There's a group of online pedophiles? <laughs> I know. Is this a support group or something? What? I don't know. I don't have any more details about what kind of group this is. But he did that too. And they found that on his computer. Larry pled guilty to both murder and child molestation. He was sentenced to 40 years of prison time with 10 years suspended, so 30 years. He is eligible for parole after serving 25 and a half years, which means he's eligible for parole in 2024. Oh, that's coming up. That is coming up. So what happened that night was he got really, really drunk. He let Amanda watch all of her favorite videos. I'm guessing probably Disney movies. He put her to bed and then 
he had decided he was going to set fire to the house. He does that, but I believe he passes out. I don't know how drunk he was, but I think he was severely drunk. He passes out. He also locks all the doors. I believe he locked the doors to get out of the house. I don't know if there were bedroom locks, but there was a mention of locking all the doors in the house. So maybe there's locks on the bedroom doors. Amanda screams as the fire comes into her room, and that's what woke him up. He then climbs out a window to save himself. The screams die down, and he hasn't called the police. So he's outside, the screams end, and he decides to go back in because there are other people around. He goes back in to try and save Amanda. To look heroic. Yes, to look heroic. And when he picks her body up, she's still alive. She's wheezing. She's suffering, I imagine, smoke inhalation. He ends up leaving her. He drops her body back on the floor and he gets out. I don't know how he explains it to people, but he gets out and then he starts practicing his reaction for when the police arrive. So he actually put her body back down Yes, on the floor of the bedroom. Yes, he could have decided to save her at the last minute because she was still alive, but he decided not to. Wow. Apparently his hatred for his ex-wife overpowered his love for his daughter. And his fear of being caught. Yes, and his fear of being caught. So that is the very sad story of Amanda Freustad. Well, that's a pisser. I mean, that's a... That's a sad story. I was floored by all these people in this group. I mean, it's one thing to do nothing. It's another thing to defend. Well, she's dead anyway. Well, she's dead so. anyway, so who cares? I mean, she's a five-year-old. Unbelievable. I, I just, I can't get over the horribleness of people. I really can't. And we do these true crime stories all the time. I know, and and I, I still dumbfounded. I know, I'm still surprised over people's reactions, still. It's amazing to me. I mean, I can understand being scared and not doing anything like, oh boy, was this all bullshit? But Oh Can't Mary. we just can't we just get back to talking about drinking? Right. Can't we I this is a support group. <laughs> this is the stupidest shit I've <laughs> ever heard. I would love to know how some of these people what they're up to today and how they feel about this case. Especially like Fred. Oh, here's a list of some therapists in your area. And then Audrey, oh, we've already gotten enough bad press. This just this is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's shameful. Very. Well, everyone, thank you very much for listening to this week's episode. If you have not subscribed or followed us yet, please do so on your podcast app. Thank you. If you would like more information about this episode or our other episodes, please go to our website, tntcrimes.com. You can also find information about becoming a member there. Yeah. Or you can find out information at patreon.com slash TNT crimes. If you become a member, there are lots of additional episodes that we have on our Patreon. I believe there's over 50 full episodes right now. There's also mini episodes. You also can get benefits such as early releases. We go live a couple times a month on our Facebook group. I also like to point out to people, if you are looking at our episode list, whatever app you're using, you'll see that there are episodes that are missing. They're not in numerical order. Those can be found free on our website, tntcrimes.com. Well, thank you for that. You're welcome. (laughs) You can also find us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, at Hardcore True Crime. Yep. So check us out. Check us out. And until next week, don't kill each other. Bye. Don't join any support groups. Don't engage in a flame war. Bye. (laughs) 